So that, that's already broad based on that. Mm -hmm. And all you need to worry about is if your teacher is there, yeah. whether you could speak to you or your manager to get your file checked at the same time. Talking, does that, does that work? Is that right? Is that talking? Yeah, yeah, fingers and toes. Yeah, it is. is but it's okay, I'll keep on talking. Is that better? What, what level should it be at in terms of that little screen? Well, I'd like to see it into the yellow. Actually. Into the yellow, okay. Well, I'll, I probably will talk a little bit. I tend to get a bit more animated as I get going, but uh, um, it will be at least that. Yeah, I'd then I'll, ch I'll check it over on the live okay. feed and uh, have a uh, change after that. Right. John will be back in a minute, won't he? So if we yeah. just wait till John gets back, and then uh, we'll uh, we'll go on to the once we're on the webcam and audio, then if you can just position yourself. Yes, I can see on there where I am, can't I? So yeah. I'll just yeah, I can just I'll just move it. Function. So half an hour max. Is it is it, is it half, oh, an hour? half an hour? Half an hour in loads. So yeah. I could, if I get it down lower, then and then yeah, it's, it doesn't matter if it's a little bit over. I mean, some of them have. Uh, I think yeah. Glenn Martin went on for uh, about forty-five, fifty. Right. Minutes. I won't go on that long. No, it's because um, because then you, you've probably got another ten minutes or fifteen minutes yeah. of questions. As well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's all it's coming through online. It's working. <clears throat> Oh, you're hearing us? Yes. Oh, it shouldn't be. I guess that's with a micro microphone on this. You. Oh, darn. Okay. Right, I am going to put us on to... Right, you're on. Is that right now, is it? I'm just going to check the side. Okay, do we have a sound check, Tim? Right. Right, you're on now, Colin. Okay, right. Well, good, good, e good evening, everybody. Um, this is a, a part of a, a Wildlife Wednesday sort of group of presentations that we've started over the last few uh, weeks and months. Um, varied, the environment's a varied thing, so um, it's got a lot of angles and perspectives to it. Um, and as well as being beautiful, it's got a lot of sort of hard-edged activity associated with it, particularly at the moment. Uh, and uh, this evening for the next sort of 20, 25 minutes, just want to look at some of the sort of nature-based solutions, if you like, that uh, nature gives to us um, in terms of a resilient economy and a resilient env environment. The two things very much go hand in hand. Uh, and now we are of a moment uh, when that is the case. Um, so we, we started the year at a time of sort of, I wouldn't say crisis, but there's a lot of interest in terms of the, the climate, a lot of concern, a lot of demonstrations. Uh, uh, Exile was doing its stuff in London, whether you thought that was the right thing or not, I don't know, but certainly some really hard-edged points a, a, a around that. 
Um, and then here in Shropshire, and indeed over the rest of many parts of the UK, we had severe flooding um, going on, which um, caused lives to come to a halt, a great deal of distress and misery. Uh, and here, particularly in Shropshire, it was one of the worst worst parts of the county to be hit by by, by flooding. And then, of course, we are here in this uh, this COVID time, and uh, that itself has its um, has its issues. Uh, not least in terms of the way we appreciate the green space around us and the need to have a bit of well-being, a little bit of joy, a little bit of comfort in terms of getting out there in the sunshine and in green, enjoying those green and tranquil places. So all those things are big issues in society at the moment and nature has a sort of role to play in perhaps um, creating some solutions and some opportunities moving forward. So um, I'm not going to give you a lecture on climate change, but uh, I've, 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 I've pinched this from Cambridge University. Um, this is a bunch of academics that are advising government now uh, as to the state of uh, climate change. And the picture you have in front of you shows you in no uncertain terms how global warming is working and it's not working very well uh, and probably it's uh, sort of at a very conservative sort of rate in terms of the, the, the stats that are shown there the one good thing if there is such a good thing to come out of the coronavirus situation is that the carbon levels drop by something like five percent at the beginning of the uh, the shutdown uh, and that will have some very 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 minor effect on the um, the climate change uh, results that come from that so you can see we're on a an upward transition to be honest coronavirus or not uh, um, we really have to do something about it and as i say nature has uh, one or two possibly tricks up its sleeve to help us do that um, and just one, one further uh, slide from, from Cambridge University, uh, and this is relates to uh, the, the carbon in the, in the atmosphere as opposed to the temperature. And um, if you were a climate change doubter, you really shouldn't be now. Um, you can see from that graph over many uh, hundreds of thousands of years, the carbon in the atmosphere has gone up and down, up and down. But in the last sort of, well, hundreds of years, it's just rocketed upwards. It is unequivocally desperate in terms of the position we're in at the moment and now is the time to do something and um, hopefully there's a few ideas uh, about how that is going at the moment. Now I'm not going to pretend I'm a sort of a, a world expert on climate change so I have actually lent heavily for the first few sort of uh, moments of this presentation on the, um, the Committee for Climate Change for, for government. So this is the government's very own committee um, that is advising them on how we would respond to the challenges of climate change. And uh, last week, some of the stats I'm just about to throw in front of you now were presented to, to George Eustace, the Environment Secretary, um, to put some of the case forward for how we might address climate change. Now, I'm gonna only concentrate on um, land use and biodiversity. There are lots of other issues around how we live our lives, where we travel our aeroplanes, how we heat our homes, and those are all big issues that we really do need to address. But for the purposes of um, tonight, uh, I'm going to talk about land use and, and then go on to how that impacts on how we might see Shropshire uh, evolve or go forward in the coming decades. So this is a, a slide to show you one of the land use big hits in terms of where carbon comes from and hence climate change worries and concerns. You probably know that this beef lamp agriculture has a big role I'm afraid to play and we all have a role to play in looking at what we eat, where we get it from and, uh, and how much we prepare to pay for it and therefore the land service of Shropshire, what does that end up being, being a county with 80% of agricultural land surface. Now you, you could get depressed by that thinking oh, I'm going to rush out and not eat beef or lamb or what have you. But the changes that have gone on in recent years in agriculture, and some of our farmers, in, and certainly the, the, the Marches and Shropshire, are some of the best in the country, and indeed the world, are, are, are being picked, picked out, there was some of the changes being picked out, to show that the decline in carbon and the resulting effect on the climate is very possible in the terms of the way we see our agricultural land. Now, the reason I'm stressing agricultural land is that uh, when you look at the most damaging impact we have on our, on our, on our biodiversity, particularly in rural areas, it's through agriculture. You cannot deny it in terms of the last 20 to 25 years. Some 60% more of species have declined dramatically uh, in Shropshire, most of that due to agricultural uh, practices. Now, the change is happening already, though, and this is a trajectory of change downwards over the next uh, 
50, 100 years that the climate change community would think will happen in the context of agriculture. And that marries in with the National Farmers Union's objectives to get uh, uh, farming in the UK to be carbon neutral by 2040. 2040. Um, now, we'd like to see it happen faster, but it's in, in, entirely reasonable, possible and encouraging to think that we can grow food to feed our nation in a way that's far more environmentally sustainable. And this is an independent group that's indicating this is the case. Now, all well, that's very interesting, but what, what, what is that going to do for biodiversity? And why will biodiversity sort of pay, if you like, in that context? Well, I'll draw your attention primarily to the England graph on the, on the left-hand side. And you can see where we are now in terms of land use. And you can see where the changes are going to have to take place if we're going to hit those targets by 2050. And what we're seeing is an increase in habitat that absorbs carbon in farmland. So we've got more trees, we've got more meadows with more botanical richness in them, more edros, uh, more copses, and probably more water bodies within, within, within the, the, the farmed environment, which in themselves will make a much richer tapestry, richer matrix for a farm landscape that will be far richer for wildlife. And what we need to do is to, to ensure to hit these climate change uh, challenges, our landscape follows suit, and our farmers, with all the modern technology at their, 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 their fingertips, and the market that's driving the prices and what they produce, which is you and I, uh, respond accordingly. Now, apologies for a few slightly dull slides, but I mean, if we're going to get to the, the, the nuts and bolts of this, we've got to understand how we're going to do it. Um, so, what the Climate Change Committee recommended to government last week, and we saw it in part come through yesterday in Boris Johnson's announcement uh, uh, plan, uh, committing to uh, a large-ish tree planting scheme across the EU, well certainly England anyway, um, across the country. What we, what we have to commit to is, is, is a bunch of, of actions. What we need is a whole new funding mechanism for how we pay for trees. And we've got to look at sort of trading carbon, i.e. if we plant trees in certain areas, maybe there's an offsetting requirement from other activities like airplane, airlines or supermarkets that, to do whatever they do to generate carbon or building operations that lay lots of tarmac or roads or what have you, that actually they use their buying power to offset um, some of the carbon challenges that we have in front of us. Um, and that can be transposed across in this case, into tree planting, and particularly tree planting in the case of us here in Shropshire, that will have to occur most largely on private land and on farmland. That's not to say that the, um, uh, the public places won't have a role to play. There's also a role to play for, for, for probably all of us as well, in terms of us wanting to invest in a philanthropic way in terms of tree, tree planting, and there's a huge amount of interest from private landowners and indeed individuals who want to see this, this happen across, across the county. And it's certainly something the Trust wants to experiment with over the coming years to try and actually put people together with resources, money, land and trees, if you like, in the right place that will cause carbon to be absorbed within the landscape and, of course, make for a far more beautiful, uh, and as we'll see later, a landscape that has an added financial value to it as well. Um, there's going to have to be an imperative around the public purse paying for some of this. going to have to be the public's purse is going to have to lead this in some way uh, and that will um, undoubtedly have to sort of drift in the direction of, of broadleaf planting uh, as opposed to some of the conifer planting that we've seen in the past. Um, that in itself could be a challenge um, because conifers grow faster and arguably they might have more market value. But in the round, the value on carbon, the value on the timber that broadleaves produce and the value in terms of things like tourism and the landscape that are sort of um, coming out of this sort of uh, planting exercise um, we've got a bigger economic sort of input impact than perhaps if we stuck with um, rather uh, dull and uh, sterile conifer planting schemes as of the past. Um, now, trees are within the Climate Change Committee were highlighted as being the big opportunity within land use, within the farm landscape, as I've said, to offset some of the carbon challenges we've got. By far and away the biggest landscape that we have, and in Shropshire we're blessed with some tremendous peatlands. Peat is sort of almost pure carbon almost, and uh, that absorbs and has absorbed more carbon than any other landscape that we have in the, in the UK. Um, and the danger there is sort of twofold really. One is if we destroy it, we release all that carbon to the atmosphere, which then increases 
the sort of temperature risk and the carbon and the particles and what have you that make that temperature risk more of a, a challenge. Um, but also as well, we have the opportunity to improve a lot of the peatland that we have in this county. Uh, a lot of it is heavily farmed at the moment and we need to change that. Uh, we need to actually change uh, farming practices that stop burning on peatland, that stop ploughing on peatland, that stop draining on peatland and actually look at the sort of top metre or more of, 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 of ground and say how do we manage that almost for, or for wet farming if you like. Uh, and that has to be done in a very sensitive and very different, a very modern manner to ensure that we can create a farm landscape that has a value for farm product, but also preserves the peatlands that we have in front of us at the moment. And I think it's fair to say, for those of you that are familiar with Shropshire, uh, particularly the Fens and Wixel area, which the Trust and Natural England have been working on for oh, now three to four years now, if you look back at the height of the peat there before it was destroyed by peat extraction uh, up to 1990, the peat level now is, is six metres lower than it was uh, when that peatland uh, was, was in a virgin state, if you like. Now, since the last, well, 30 years now, naturally England now, naturally England ourselves, are looking at restoring that peat and making it grow. Now, that sounds easy. It's not. It's a very long game, but we can get it to grow slowly. And as it grows and more bog-loving plants make more peat, they can absorb more carbon and very slowly we can begin to sort of absorb the carbon back into the environment as well as have a tremendous rich uh, natural landscape as we have in the peatlands of North Shropshire and South Cheshire. And of course to make that happen there's a practical process but there's a bunch of money that needs to happen as well and uh, that links very much to public funding and dare I say a bit of sort of a um, restriction, if you like, on what is possible moving forward. We cannot see the peatland destruction that we have seen, not just in 1990, but even in the last 10 years, continue in a county like Shropshire. Um, the final sort of climate change sort of area um, is, is, is around low, low carbon uh, in, in, in general. Uh, and here we are in a strange situation here. We, we in, in Shropshire, very focused situation in terms of the challenges around this that we've got. We have a very rich farmland. We have issues around water, both lack of water in the summer sometimes and um, too much water in the winter. And I'll come on to that in a little more detail in a minute. But in the farming context, what that has created is a, a, is a sort of nutrient, um, sort of vulnerable zone situation, if you like, where nutrients are going into the water course um, and actually just, uh, and also at the same time, destroying some of the, the soil substrates. And actually by the soil substrates being destroyed, they themselves are then releasing more nutrient into water courses, creating more pollution, which is the water makes it more expensive to clean for start for us to drink, um, but then emits more carbon in, in, into the atmosphere. And I think one big issue, one really big issue we have, and we have a real critical point in the farming sort of world at the moment, uh, following the Brexit decision, and indeed, all the decisions we have to make for how we feed our world and how our farmers here in Shropshire and in England and indeed over the border in Wales, how they're going to survive in a very volatile world market trade situation. Uh, well, one of the ways they do things is, is to actually farm very effectively and have a good sort of clean environmental record, uh, which indeed they have in many instances. Um, we've only got to, look, got to look at the chlorinated chicken argument in America to see some of the poorer standards that we do not want to see in this country. But here at home, I mean, used chicken is a really live example. I mean, here on the, on the borders of Wales, in Shropshire, we are the chicken shed capital of, uh, of the UK. Ireland does a bit as well, Northern Ireland. We are the chicken shed capital. Now, the releases of nutrients into the air, the air they themselves uh, are an issue. As we sit here now, four times the nutrient lo loading of nitrates in the atmosphere is prevalent. But what that means in terms of carbon and farming is that we have more methane going into the atmosphere, but it also begins to change some of the, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the soil and vegetation structures. And we've seen the evidence of that beginning to happen uh, at Fens and Wixler, where we've been doing some work over the last few years to monitor that. Certain plants that used to survive don't anymore because more, more, more virulent, more aggressive plants are coming in. And they themselves, like Millennia, for example, big tufty reedy thing, grows better than other more delicate plants and then that dries out the moss which then causes more carbon to be released as water leaves and, uh, and the, 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 the carbon oxi oxidizes. Um, so we've got to look at how we manage our air, our carbon in the ground, 
and our tree planting in the right places. And that's what the um, Climate Change Committee is recommending to government at the moment. Now, apologies, move on to slightly more exciting slides. Um, what we've got now in front of us is a, a very conservative estimate of what the Climate Change Committee thinks are the societal benefits um, to us, as in England, primarily anyway, if we began to put in place some of those things I've, I, I, I've very quickly um, summarised over the last few, few minutes. And if we did that, they would show £95 billion worth of benefit to society. And that benefit would be in relation to greenhouse gases and emissions, which I've just mentioned, recreational benefits in terms of landscape change, I'll come back to that in a minute, air filtration, cleaning the air, um, by having dirty air, you have much higher incidences of, of health problems. Uh, the highest incidences of asthma, for example, in Shropshire, funnily enough, is near Whitchurch, uh, which is near where some of this uh, oxidisation of carbon has been going on. We can't prove the link, but it's, it's strange that it is there. It could be, it could be a link. Um, and, and, and then also the physical health benefits by people having access to high quality environment, come back to that in a minute, makes them feel a lot better. And then finally, flood management, um, the, manage the management which is obviously um, going to be improving the economic well-being of, um, of the county and indeed the country. So as I say, the Climate Change Committee put to government last week £95 billion pounds worth of benefit if those measures that I've just shot through um, were put into place and there was a long-term plan to reverse some of the trends uh, around climate change and associated challenges. Now, to be more tangible, um, we're talking about nature-based solutions here and we're talking about um, uh, how the, um, the, the environment can give an economic benefit. Now, personally, I mean, I, I'm motivated by the environment giving me a sort of spiritual benefit if you like it's very beautiful it makes me feel better it makes me feel tremendous as an, indi as an individual and many of you presumably will feel the same but in hard stats and we've got some now um, there's a growing evidence to show that it's the it's the lucre not just the love that counts if you like um, so three years ago now the trust along with partners um, did a, a, an economic analysis of what the environment was worth in the marches which is simplistic hereford Shropshire and Telford and Reekin. Um, and that's tied in with the enterprise zone um, that we have here in the marches. And at that time, bear in mind these figures are three years old now, we reckon natural capital value, the value of the natural, that natural world, uh, was around about £4.8 billion. Pounds. Now, um, that was backed up by economic argument, uh, very complex, and there's a lot of other economic argument we could have put in, but we just couldn't get the hard stats to make that figure bigger, although it undoubtedly is bigger. Now, the economic strategy for the same area, launched by the March Energy uh, March Enterprise Partnership, along with the local authorities, um, has a very similar value. GVA, gross value added, 15 billion. Now, these figures, it's difficult to compare them like for like, but they are very similar. Uh, and as a sort of headline indicator of how we should take the environment seriously, linked to money, that's not a bad balancing act to begin to base some of our thinking. So a couple more tangible examples now, what, what, what we mean by beginning to put a value on the economy and the environment here in, in Shropshire. Um, this, this picture here uh, summarises what we hope to launch, we will be launching in the next few days, which is a woodland strategy along with the Forestry Commission and other agencies as well, to double the tree cover in the marches, uh, which includes, uh, includes Shropshire. This slide was generated by the Shropshire County Council, so it refers just to Shropshire. And what that gives is an asset value and an annual value of trees within the landscape within Shropshire. So you've got an asset value of three, 375 billion and an annual value of 4.9 billion pounds to the economy of Shropshire uh, by having the tree cover that it has at the moment. And the irony is we have one of the lowest tree covers in England, and indeed in Europe, something like 9, 9%. And the aspiration is to at least double that by 2050. And to double that, we would need to see between 200 and 300 hectares of trees in Hereford and in Shropshire and in Telford um, every year to, to, up to 2050 to see that happen. But you'll see on that slide there, if you can squint hard enough, there's a whole bunch of things there that forests do in terms of forest product, products, sequestration, cleaning of the air, uh, recreation, uh, and flood, flood mitigation. Um, and, and health benefits as well, particularly in the urban areas. 
those are the figures that's the basis for the figures uh, that that particular diagram represents real big value in terms of trees in, in Shropshire um, now the most recent and sobering and most upsetting for many was what happened in sort of January February beginning of March um, but I need to remind anybody that lives in, uh, in, in, in Shropshire particularly Ludlow and Shrewsbury and other places along the seven south big stuff happened in terms of floods now the soundbite there the sound bites there are actually even more alarming the average cost of the floods per day was at least a million pounds a day at least a million pounds a day probably more than that as well probably more uh, certainly Herefordshire County Council reckoned it costs every day there's a flood in Hereford a million pounds just to remedy the road problems they have so you can see the estimate for a million pounds a day which is an environment agency estimate is probably underestimated undercooked um, another soundbite which is more sobering and why the climate change argument has to be really taken seriously is that the River Severn is going to go up in av on average by eight, 850 centimetres by 2050 on average by 850 centimetres. Um, now, if you think of what we had in February, and then you think that's an average figure, now sometimes it's going to be less than the average because we have drought and we will have drought, and that's going to be a problem in itself in terms of water supply. So the average will be much more than 850 centimetres. So stick another metre or so on top of what you saw in February, and you've got some serious stuff to think about in terms of disruption to society and the economy. Um, so that million pound a day. Uh, is, um, is, is, is massive and needs some serious value for judgments taken on it as to how we, we, we deal with it. And one final <coughs> link, um, just by way of soundbite, uh, is, and this is in Hereford, um, we, we, at the moment we're seeing, we, we know we, we have a housing issue, low cost housing is essential uh, for, for many young people or people without the resources to, to buy, um, not low cost housing of course, uh, but at the moment over a thousand homes are being stopped in terms of development because of the nutrient loading on the team and the lug, the rivers. Now what that means, they fall, they flow into the seven. What that means is, is that ostensibly agriculture is putting this stuff into the river, but if you build more houses around it, more stuff goes to the river on an already overloaded river that is illegal in terms of European or what will commonly be UK government standards in terms of rivers. So therefore you cannot build houses, any more houses around that river until that, that, that problem is solved. Another part of the, the, the country, there is huge sort of nutrient schemes going on to resolve that in the Solent in Hampshire and so on. There is some big landscape schemes to try and stop runoff going into the Solent. Um, and we need some very serious thinking around that in our part of the world as well, if we don't want to have huge costs incurred in, in flooding and related issues. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to bring it as, as we sort of get towards the end, bring it down to the trust level if you like um, what are we doing about it uh, it's, it's really forced our thinking this is a slide it's quite beautiful actually it's, it's, a, it's a site that was completely devoid of wildlife interest in 2008 when the trust bought it uh, Holly Banks uh, we bought it as a sort of an experiment to see how we might manage an area very heavily flooded this is the most flooded part of Shropshire in terms of frequency, frequency of flooding uh, the last well, last winter period, over 12 weeks of flooding, and we're talking a metre or two metres or more on this site, took place. So what we're trying to do here is to build a wildlife habitat that is wonderful for wildlife, and it is, but it also holds water as well. So in the wintertime, you will get um, uh, whooper swans coming down from Greenland, We'll get to teal wintering there. It's a beautiful place. Summertime's one of the last few places that curly still still nest, and you can hear cuckoos fairly regularly. In the middle of this picture is Holly Banks, and this isn't a major flood. This was this was a, a summer flood uh, or the back end of summer around about September, uh, as you can see by the leaves on the trees. But it gives you a feel for how wet this area area is. Now, if this area and it flooded as two meters largely in the winter period this year um, the, the flows were flowing to the worst bits of the river seven were at ironbridge in terms of pushing it through at 470 cubic meters 470 tons each an hour um, the water the holly banks alone held which is the site in the middle of here um, if it had one or two meters of water on it would equate to wait for it 10 seconds of reduced or, or flow of the river seven through the most um, pressurised bit of the river, 10, 10 seconds. Now, I think that's nothing, and it's not a lot really, 
But if you imagine Holly Banks being 100 times bigger, you've got 100 times 10 seconds and so on. Um, but you've also got to think as well, in February, the worst point of the flooding, the defences in most parts of the Severn, all along its length, were only 20 centimetres short of topping, 20 centimetres short. Now, what that converts into is a need to reduce the peak flows. And you need sites like this to hold the water to reduce the peak flows. And in terms of seconds, it doesn't need to be a lot. We don't know exactly what it is, but we know that the only way to solve the flooding on the Severn is to do land management schemes that reduce flow convincingly and fast, uh, of flowing fast over a large part of the Severn. And therefore, that has a big economic value, which arguably has probably more value than some of the conventional farming activities that are being pursued here at the moment. That's not to say we don't farm, we do, but we farm differently. So that was around the flooding agenda in Shropshire, which is a big uh, nature sort of um, economic sort of potential opportunity. Development is a huge issue as well. In this county, we're going to see more, gener more, more development in a generation than ever before if we pursue all the plans that are in place at the moment. We'll skip around whether the numbers are right or wrong or not, but we're going to look at 25 to 35,000 homes plus. It's more than a generation, as I say, um, in Shropshire and Telford and Reekin. Probably going to be more than that. Now, there's ways of doing development to make it more environmentally um, cost-effective, which actually makes the properties more cost-effective as well. This is a slide of Lightmore, which is the, what the trust, the site trust has been working on for the best part of a decade now with Bourneville Village Trust. And throughout this site, there are drainage schemes that reduce flooding, slow the flow into rivers like the Severn nearby. And there's green space amongst this development now, as this was being built, um, but the green space integrating within it, a wildlife site, rich in wildlife, that people can go out and wander through their communities very, very easily, very, very quickly into green spaces. The school is, 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 is a green, fair place to send your kids. The benefits are huge, um, and um, this mirrors well with the philosophy of Bourneville Village Trust, where they say, oh, how put in place, 25% social housing in this particular development of, uh, of an excess of 700 homes. You wouldn't know which is social housing, which is how it should be, uh, but the social housing there with folk with issues uh, that, uh, that, that, that the national environment can only sort of benefit uh, along with, us, say, um, any benefit in terms of biodiversity, but also reducing flood uh, f flows, flowing off these developments. Hard, hard standings are not great for, for flood flows going into the nearby River, river Severn. Um, there are other developers working like that. We've got a big site we're working with at, uh, at Ulscut, the old sugar beet factory near Telford. Some great conversations going on there with the development, developer how we might do that. Um, and we've just taken on a site uh, in Monkmore in Shrewsbury from Shropshire Homes where we're looking at how we better manage the environment within the housing environment on a small housing estate as an experiment which might be sort of pushed out across the wider Shrewsbury area. Now the, the, the next thing I want to deal with briefly is uh, in terms of economic benefit um, is, is, is tourism and recreation. Um, if you were to look at all the economic benefits that this, this county generates, tourism is by far and away the biggest economic driver uh, in the in the county. It's four times that of agricultural production, um, which is which is quite illuminating. Although we have to realise that the majority of people come here to experience our beautiful market towns and our natural environment and our landscapes, um, and that landscape is largely farmed. So there's a role for the farmer, the agriculturalist, in that in that job. But we want to actually make sure that the, the goose that laid the golden egg isn't destroyed and we, we maintain our beautiful Shropshire landscape. And this is a trust reserve just to emphasize the point. You know, you've got oh, this is on Office Dyke, this is Lanaman at Rocks, um, one of our older trust reserves. It's gradually over the years expanded along Lanaman at Hill in the background. There's a golf course there for those that like golf. There's a wonderful SSSI all over it. People climb there, you walk off as dive, as, I, as I've said, and it has 12 species of orchids. It's one of the best places in, in, in Shropshire and on the borders of Wales, one of the best in Wales, actually, for butterflies, um, which it's, it's, it's a thoroughly amazing place. Um, so it's a landscape that can generate money and, and benefits to, to society as a whole across a sort of wider spectrum around recreation and tourism and there are many places like uh, like this in Shropshire and we, we need to make sort of subtle and sensible and sustainable use of them running forward into the future. So as I said, tourism in Shropshire worth about a billion quid every year, billion quid. 
got to do something to make that better. We don't have a plan, decent plan for, for, for tourism yet. We need it. Uh, and particularly now, we're not going to be zooming off to the Bahamas or Marbella for our holidays. We'll be staycationing. Um, we need to think seriously how we might manage that. And incidentally, 60 to 70 percent, I think it is, of our of Shropshire reserves are within three miles of all the homes in Shropshire and around 50% uh, are within two miles. So there's a reserve near you, so it's a, it's a marvellous resource that Trust is, is privileged to manage. So to finish, um, just to sort of show how the world possibly goes full circle in terms of economics and, and nature, um, and how it hasn't been the first time that we've begun to think about what the benefits of nature are to the economy and to our landscape. This is uh, Catherine Common. Um, the Wildlife Trust in Shropshire's biggest nature reserve, 550 odd acres, I think. And a marvellous place, mostly SSSI, some amazing plant assemblages, insect assemblages, still has ground nesting birds there in reasonable numbers. Um, but if you were there 150 years ago, it was almost at the heart of the Industrial Revolution. Mining, quarrying, there were ropeways there in, in industrial sort of numbers, taking great big chunks of the landscape out and shipping them out to trackways and railways and, and eventually out to the River Severn to be shipped out of, out, of, out of Shropshire. And you look at it now, it's a beautiful landscape. Um, so nature has a way of fighting back um, and it certainly has a value intrinsically like this and an economic one like it did 150 years ago and like it has now in uh, the year 2020. So thank you. Um, that's the end of the presentation. I don't know there are any questions at all? Oh, yeah, yeah, I've got um, a few questions here. The first question is, um, farmers are notoriously conservative. How do we get them to farm carbon rather than crops? Um, I, I, I think I'm going to... I don't want to sound rude, actually. Not all farmers are conservative, but it's interesting. When we did uh, consult over the recent agricultural bill uh, at uh, Harper Adams College, we talked to a lot of young farmers and they most certainly were not conservative. And we did ask them what was the blockage um, around much of the sort of things that we've been talking about here. And the blockage was, they said, old farmers, which I thought was a bit rude, because I know some really great old farmers, but I think in a way, that tongue in cheek, some of the answer there is, is in the young, gen young generation, obviously. Um, there's also a fiscal element to this as well. We have to incentivize you think the farming world has been incentivised since the Second World War by yours and my taxes, but we benefit from it, from a sustainable and healthy and decent food supply. But now we've got to subsidise that in a very different way, to not just produce food, but to produce a flood resilient landscape, and produce clean air, and to produce something that our tourism sector, particularly in these post-COVID times, is going to struggle to recover from, a landscape that people want to come and visit and, and, and stay in. So, in a sense, there's, there's, a, there's a new generation of farmer coming along that's going to farm floods and farm tourism and grow high quality food. And probably not grow food in the same way as it did in certain bits of the uplands, for example, where at the moment, arguably, far, well, farming is not commercially viable in the uplands at the moment. But the upland is absolutely critical that we have farms doing the right thing in the uplands, because without it, it would be a, a disaster, as hopefully you've picked out from some of the things I've been saying recently. Um, next question was around the, the nation's health uh, is, is a high and expensive priority at the moment. How do we integrate health and well-being into nature-based solutions? Um, that's a very obvious thing that we need to do, but it's an incredibly hard thing to do. Personally, I think we're a generation away from it. The evidence is all there. I mean, you, know, you would struggle to socially distance, I'm sure, some of you over the last few weeks going to some of the urban places, because there's so many people there, maybe not even some of the urban places. Certainly Bournemouth was a pretty difficult place to socially distance from. Um, but what we've got to do, we've got to build resilient urban landscapes that people can walk out into where they, where they live. And there's got to be some proper investment in that as well. And, and it's, it is quite scary at the moment that the health sector hasn't got the ability to link the sort of brilliant health care it gives with the sort of indirect benefits that are a healthy, um, uh, environment will will, 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 will endeavour to deliver. I mean, obesity levels in certain parts of the county, Shropshire and Telford, go into sort of the th mid 30% at the moment. And now if you've got somewhere decent to go out and walk and exercise and picnic or whatever, that certainly helps. And diabetes is certainly of a similar percentage in certain parts of our communities. So likewise, getting exercise and decent fresh air is essential. We're a long way from putting the link together to say, 
the health sector needs to buy into this, but it'd be far cheaper dealing with it at source than it would be on a hospital bed or in a, in a surgery, um, which is, is obviously very, very, very costly. And we've also got to deal with it in terms of our town planning as well. We really need more proactive and more creative plan town planning. Um, I think it's with some um, sort of optimism we look at places like Shrewsbury, which had a town plan, big town plan, about 12 months ago, which spoke very highly of the green assets that it's got in the town. But we've got to see it through, and we've got to make sure those, those assets are built or, or invested in properly. Do you know the most visited, if you go on Strava, the website that shows you where people run and cycle, the most visited part of Shrewsbury is the ring road, because you can run around it. That's scary, that shouldn't be the case. So we've got to think carefully when we think about some of the biggest inward investment projects we're ever going to see, like the Northwest Road going around Shrewsbury. Uh, you've got to question whether it's going to deliver the goods, and you've also got to question whether it's going to exacerbate uh, people's access to environment, because possibly it's going to stop it or reduce it, or more pertinently, probably take resources away from the investment needed to build a more resilient uh, landscape that people can move through in a town like, like Shrewsbury, or indeed any market town or town in our, in our county or our country. So the last question I think was, uh, what do you see Shropshire looking like in 50 years time? Will it be wall to wall trees? Um, no, it won't be, no, it won't be. I mean, you know, I, I, I do fancy if I'm, well, if I'm spare, it probably won't be, but we need to eat uh, and we need to have places to live. We need to be able to drink water as well. So there's a whole mix of stuff. And I think Shropshire's in a great place. We're gonna to have to have towns that people want to live in that are clean and green and walking. We can take kids out in push chairs and young mums can do what they do. Old people looked after in a community that's healthy and accessible and, and, and integrated. And the environment's a key part of all that. We need a landscape that's accessible as well, where you can get out without having to get in a car that's going to belt out fumes and create more problems for carbon. And some of the landscapes we're going to want to, we're going to, want to visit, and we've got them uh, in plenty. You know, the, the iconic Stiper Stones, the Clee Common that I was showing, the Lanamon Rocks, the incredible sort of Fens and Wixel Mosses. We've got to work hard to, to, to invest in them more and make them bigger and better and more, and more resilient. And we've all got a role to play in it. The farmers have, the industrialists have. You know, there's no, no reason why developers building homes in towns like Shrewsbury and Ludlow and Telford should not be investing in the green space around them in a more considered way than is happening at the moment. Some, some, there's some pretty terrible big developments been planned at the moment where the green space within it is rubbish. We've got to do a lot better and up the game. Uh, and I think um, developers have a role to play as do farmers, as do ourselves. So I'm quite optimistic, actually. Um, the last few years haven't been great. But weirdly, this COVID crisis time has given us time to reflect. And I think uh, we've got a great place in Shropshire to do all these magnificent things rolling forward. Thank you. Um, I think that's, that's the end. Um, what I want to do is just drop my note. It's just to remind you that um, um, we have a further uh, talk next Wednesday or presentation by Dr. Kath Price, um, and that will be on, on garden birds, something that many of you will have appreciated greatly over the last few weeks, being confined to home if you're looking enough to have a garden or a window box or what have you. Um, so please, please tune into that. And just a reminder as well, we are a membership organisation. Without you, we could not survive. So we need more membership to obviously give us the money, give us the resources to do what we do, and to give us the mandate to have a more powerful voice to protect nature in Shropshire. Thank you very much. <laughs>